Consciousness, the final frontier. These are the voyages into the universe, the universe between, between your ears. ears. Our mission, to explore collective wisdom, seek out amazing secrets, and spread the message of personal potential. All right, hello everyone. I am Tim C. Starr. I'm your host for The Universe Between Your Ears. I'm joined on this voyage by uh, my co-host, Mr. Gabi Musheyev. Hello to everyone. Great to be here again. And uh, we have a special guest with us here, Michael Namkung. Um, Michael's an artist and an entrepreneur. He's received awards for his work from San Francisco Art Commission, Center for Cultural Innovation, the is it TAN or TANI Foundation. Hey. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Andy Warhol Foundation, among others. He's exhibited work in galleries, museums, universities, and public spaces worldwide. He's worked with hundreds of individuals through his Drawing Gym project, which combines drawing and physical exercise. He's a multiple national and world champion ultimate Frisbee player, and he applies his deep experience with flow states and the emotional life of high-performing athletes to the inner game of his art and entrepreneurship. I invited him because the things that he teaches entrepreneurs are valuable for the rest of us. So, Michael, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Glad to thank have you. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really exciting to be here, and, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So oh, you, You'll get over that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get over the looking forward to it part. <laughs> yeah, it's the really exciting part. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, the thing... Let me read this because, you know, I don't read this normally, but uh, for people who don't know, when somebody wants to come on the show, we've got a whole list of questions that they have to fill out. And because uh, sometimes we don't know anything about them and we, we need to learn a little something. But uh, one of the questions is, what's the message that you're sharing? And Michael, you part of what you said here was artists and entrepreneurs are more alike than we often recognize. Both look out on the world and are dissatisfied with the status quo. And they're so driven to create, to give form, presence, and voice to something that doesn't yet exist. And it struck me because it, it's, I believe that we're all, our, I don't want to say our purpose here exactly, but the, the thing that drives, we all are creators, all of the, we don't have an option, right? It's just, it's happening between our ears all of the time. And so I, you know, I was struck by that because this, this brings it home to everybody. And, you know, what we try to do is to, to give a little something to the audience that they might be able to, to click with and, and turn around and use in their own lives. And um, kind of not sure where I'm going with this, but I want to talk about creativity and its importance in, in everyone's life, not just for an artist or an entrepreneur. You know. Right. So. Yeah, you, you talk about something called uh, what, ultimate creativity. I think is what you teach. Yeah. You know, along that line. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the the first thing that I think about um, when thinking about creativity is is all the myths that we have about it, and we have a lot of them. Um, and but they all are sort of versions of the same thing, which is that creativity is something that some of us have and some of us don't have. Mm -hmm. um, when that's just plain and simply false. This is not true. There's no truth to that at all. And we can look at how we come into this world as proof of this, right? We come in as creative beings, or at least tapped into our creative energies. We can see by watching young children how it works. We see them in creative flow. Um, at some point, most of us, at some point in our childhood, most of us decide that, well, we're not we're not talented enough at it, or this really isn't my forte. And so we kind of turn off our sensitivity to our creative energies. Um, and we tell ourselves that creativity is something that some have, and for whatever reason I don't have, or it's too, I'm not rewarded in, in um, going there, so I'm not going to explore that. And so we, we literally kind of lose track of that, and we forget. And so we kind of grow up with this feeling that, um, and it, you hear this from so many people um, in your lives, at least I do as a, as someone who, as an artist and someone who creates uh, and talks about creativity is people say things like, Oh, you're so creative. 
right? <laughs> or they'll say on the, the reverse side, oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body, things like that. Um, but the fact is we're constantly creating and we can't help it. Right. Uh, and it's we're, either we're creating from our heart and we're creating from this aligned place or we're creating something or recreating or miscreating something that's in our heads, some pattern that is making us comfortable. And we create this day after day after day. So we are infinitely creative. And the only question, the question I ask is, how can we create what we want versus what, um, and take power over and take uh, ownership over what we are creating versus feeling like living under the illusion that we're not actually doing it because we are doing it. But we're making a choice to be creative in a certain way um, or in, in a way that's either empowering to us or in a way that doesn't serve us. And then we feel trapped. And um, so, yeah, it's a, I, I think I'm, I know that I'm on a, some kind of mission to unlock that creative energy, energy that's locked up inside of so many people. I mean, I see it constantly, how much it, it even among creative people, even among artists, mm -hmm. like we learn, we have learned if we, especially if we've gone through school and learned from mentors who did certain, certain things a certain way, we also sort of learn um, or un, we learn how to listen to others instead of our inner voice. And so even creative people struggle with their creative expression. And in fact, the whole designation of that we give ourselves as artists and creators, people who self-identify as creative, that can be a stumbling block to opening our own creative channel because we can get locked into, oh, I am this type of person. I am this type of artist. This is how I create. Right. Um, and that can be a limiting, uh, that can something, be something that puts the lid on what actually is trying to come out and through you. Well, we have, we have, definitions for everything right we have we have to label things otherwise nobody has any idea what we're talking about but the labels come with preconceived definitions and if you have just something in your head that says an artist does these things and then I can see how that if you say yeah, I'm an artist you're kind of locking yourself into what you believe an artist is supposed to be versus where you might otherwise go right right yeah mm -hmm. and so I guess that the thing I the thing that I think is so interesting that we don't normally connect is this idea that artists and entrepreneurs are actually um, taking a bold step out to um, away from that paradigm of uh, whatever identity they've previously held themselves to, right? So, um, and that there's not something, there's something wrong in the world or there's something that's unsatisfying about the way that things are and they're trying to create something new um, that doesn't, they feel that there's this purpose moving out into them and moving through them and they're trying to make the business or make the artwork or make the whatever it is. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's people that are sort of ready to embrace that voice in themselves, I think are really interesting because they're at a pivotal point, right? They're ready to, they feel that creative energy bubbling up inside them. It's coming through them and they're, they're no longer able to keep the lid on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, there's a, uh, I can never remember this person's name. There was someone who did a, um, a, uh, I, she wrote a blog post, which later became a book, I believe. Um, it's someone who worked with hospice, worked in hospice for several years and, and um, asked people who were dying what their regrets were. Right. I think it's, the book is called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying, I think. Um, but the number one regret was, I wish I had lived a life true to myself instead of what others expected of me. And that's a place where I'm, I'm, that's a question I try to ask myself every day is what is it that I'm you know, trying to be true? What's, what's the truth that's coming through me versus, and this is something that artists struggle with as they try to enter the art world is that, well, the art world is set up for a certain, and also you could think about this in, from an entrepreneurial perspective, the world of business is set up from a, it, that has certain sort of fixed things or certain right. things we understand that's happening. And in order to fit into it, in order to be seen in it, we have to first show up with, the same types of ways that people show up in that world. And otherwise we're not recognized at all. But at some point we have to be able to see that we're following someone else and what is the, and listen to the, what is the thing that's coming out from here, from inside versus how am I going to make something that allows me to feel like I fit in, that gets me the award or the approval or the pat on the head or the recognition. Um, and that's a difficult question to, to wrestle with because we are also are wired for, social acceptance and we need to have mm -hmm. community and we need to fit in in certain ways, right? But um, there is also at the same time an, a very unique 
very powerful energy that moves through us that um, if we put too much energy into the fitting in part of it, we, we lose sight of yeah. what we're dealing for. You stifle that other. That Have you found, people. Michael, in your interactions with artists, right? Uh, people um, who are involved uh, on a daily basis, you know, creating works of art, uh, thinking, um, trying to liberate themselves from, from the self, I guess, as you were describing, right? And connect to that creative power. Have you found among them that most of them, if not all, have that feeling that they're pursuing this mission of, uh, I guess, achieving that kind of freedom before they get to making art? Or do you feel that they're struggling just like any other human being, you know, trying to uh, break down those social uh, programming and norms or whatever in order to get to that creative state? Um, I, I, think it, the, I think those can happen together, mm. both of those phenomena. And, and, and there's a, such a wide range of... of um, types of people that come to creative work, right? They decide to make art. Um, and some of them are, some of them do have a message that's, that's coming through them. Um, some of them are using their work to find that message. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it, it is, there is a desire for freedom. That is something that, I, that feels universal, that seemed universal to me. There's a desire for a freedom from, a freedom from the social structures that we find ourselves trapped in or locked in or bound by. Um, and then these forms of expression are, are ways um, around those, those things that we, that we see. And we, we feel this thing that we don't see. We feel this energy that and we don't see that reflected in the world. And we want to bring that to the world as our sort of gateway to what we feel is true, right? That we, don't, we haven't seen manifest. And we're trying to manifest that. So, yeah, and it is a struggle. It is, um, but it doesn't... There's different, I think, phases or periods of an artist's trajectory where that um, that flow is comes naturally and easily, and other times where it gets really bound up um, without us realizing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That has to be like a block, right? I remember um, yeah. there was a great um, fragment uh, from a movie. We we often have movie nights, and we recently watched the movie where um, a grandma approached uh, her um, granddaughter who was, I guess, out in, in nature trying to compose poetry. And she had like a, like a muse block or whatever, a creativity block, right? Yeah. And uh, Jane Fonda actually was a grandma, playing a grandma in that movie. And she... Um, she uh, she said, "Well, you, you're having difficulty expressing yourself." Um, and um, uh, the the teenager was trying to write poetry about love, and the grandma said, "Well, have you opened yourself to love? Have you experienced love?" Uh, and she said, "No, I, I have not." It's like, well, you know, you you need to open yourself for love before you could express it, right? How could you write about something that without, first of all, achieving that freedom, you know, and opening yourself up for that, right? And it, that kind of like, sort of like felt uh, as a, an approach to any creative work, love, um, just really achieving that deep level of freedom, right? First, first. And, um, when you are now connecting this to the entrepreneurship, right? So artists and entrepreneurship. Uh, I was contemplating that before this interview and I was thinking um, entrepreneurs, I mean, of course there are different kinds of entrepreneurs, but if their uh, main uh, purpose is not creativity um, in the way you describe it, but uh, success of a business enterprise, right um do you think that inspiration could come from that kind of thing you know com commercial success or making certain service available to 
uh, like a large mass of people, you know, uh, whatever, or, or making a good buck, you know, at the end of the day, really, uh, like huge, you know, profits, whatever. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think that, well, that will not be like a muse block, like a creativity block, because there's a, a motive there that may be not so um, aligned with, uh, you know, with achieving that enlightened state. Let's put it this way. Hmm. So uh, your question is, is um, when you bring artists, <laughs> when you um, like uh, marry entrepreneurship and, yeah. uh, and creativity, um, as you're expressing from an artist's point of view, right? Right. How do you reconcile that, the purpose? You know, what drives an entrepreneur versus what drives an artist? It are not the same things, right? Well, not necessarily, but they could also be exactly the same things. I mean, you could ask the same question about artists who make more commercial work, um, artists who uh, find themselves um, basically running a business around producing a commodity or producing a, a thing, a product that's um, replicable and that sells and that have, fills some sort of market need. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's one, there's one um, very uh, vociferous uh, group of artists who will look at that type of artist and say that they're sellouts, right? This is not artwork. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and I think that there's the, the problem is when we start to um, to ask that either or question, um, because certainly um, artists suffer a little, not a little bit. Artists suffer quite a lot from this idea that money is bad, right? Their money is not connected um, to their work, and that their work is all about their passion, and that should be enough, right? Mm -hmm. So artists in general have a pretty negative money mindset or a, a pretty low value of their own of their own work but like they don't know how to value their work and we're not taught in school or in, not inside and outside of art school we're taught and we're conditioned to not put a monetary value on our work we're told that if we do that we're tainting the purity of our work okay. um but there's also sort of an underlying message there that allows us to think that way, and which is that basically art is not valuable. So if an artist believes that what they do is valuable, just like if an entrepreneur believes what they do is valuable, um, they can stand in the value of that work, and they can stand in the power of that work and share that with the world. Right? And so if that creative energy is shared, right, there's, that's coming from an aligned place. It's this something moving in me. There's something I need to get out into the world. I want to share that. Right? Mm -hmm. Versus I want to create something so that I can get money or so that I can take something from the world. That's a completely different kind of energy. Um, and both you know, entrepreneurs can be really um, creative, sort of coming, creating from that giving place, or they can be creating from that receiving, like taking place. Right? Right. The same thing right. with adults. Yeah. So it's a matter of um, asking oneself, what is the desire? What's the, what's the real drive here? What's moving? Is it, is it a, a selfish desire or is it a giving desire? Is it a, is it a, is it a desire to exp for that voice that's, in to be, that, that's inside to be expressed, mm -hmm. self-expressed in the world? Or is it about um, creating the right kind of spectacle or attention so that I can benefit financially. Um, and again, those are not completely mutually exclusive, right? There's a way in which we can receive money in a way that's in line. Right, it's all about the, the balance, the balance, right? right? The balance, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's not uh, in any extreme, right? Uh, receiving and giving have to be balanced. Actually, actually this is yeah. one, of the, one, one of the major, major points of, of uh, many spiritual uh, you know schools right uh, that uh, you cannot just give yourself away it's gonna exhaust your vessel right Kabbalah will say it will exhaust your vessel and you're not gonna be able to continue that for too long right. you have to become a channel that fills you up to the point when you start also giving what you receive channeling 
so to speak, the light, right, to the others. And yeah. in that balance, you find that um, fulfillment, right? Um, yeah. So in, incredible. Um, so when when the artists, and I see that in many artists, they kind of have sort of like their projects they that are commercial. Oh, yeah. And then there is like untouched territory that are like sacred territory where they do their creative work that is not tainted by money. And th those works are usually uh, kind of exposed to a different kind of audience even. You know? They're really different worlds. Yeah, yeah, different worlds. Yeah, yeah. And then you basically you go f that you do for sustenance. The other thing you for uh, for uh, um, let's put it uh, uh, for material sustenance versus the other you do for spiritual sustenance, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah, but that's a trap too, right? To, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is something artists suffer from. This the commercial artist suffers from. Uh, the taking energy and the, the, the say the fine artist or the non-commercial artist suffers from the too much giving energy, right? Yes. They don't know how to ask for and stand up for the value of what they're doing, right? We mm -hmm. fall into, we're encouraged to fall into this, this, this mm -hmm. mode of, I will take whatever you, you will give me mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than say, this is what this is. This is the power of this. Right. This is the value of this. Right. I, I see that with many actors, amazing uh, artists, you know, actors, yeah who will do a commercial movie only to go ahead and spend the next five years doing independent movies because that will, that will finance, you know, uh, there are the creative efforts, you know, uh, yeah. creative pursuits, you know, uh, that won't pay a, a dime, you know, and, and oftentimes actually result in loss, in financial loss. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's incredible. So, but, but creatively it's, it's much more fulfilling. Oh yeah, they're, they're not yeah. as restricted. They're not, you know, the 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 product of of uh, what they produce isn't butchered and bastardized, on you know, in the cutting room, and uh, it's it's yeah, they're able to bring more of, of themselves it, into it, right? Rarely, I think you find artists who are able to do both, like in one kind of project, right? Um, I think that. One example I'll tell you, I think personally, is uh, James Cameron who did uh, Avatar, and mm -hmm. you know they they're not, and this is the the most uh, I, the the highest grossing movie of all times I think at the box office, right? And the, to me it was the mo like uh, I was shocked. I went to see that movie three times. It was an amazing uh, creative uh, work, right? So and and the messages were really powerful as well so yeah I, I think he achieved it you know in one project the commercial success and at the same time uh, well, that, that goes to what michael was saying they don't have to be mutually exclusive yeah exactly mm -hmm. and it's it's challenging though to put them together and that's but that's the that's the big puzzle right and that's the challenge that's before us is how do we get out of this mindset that art is something that i do for myself and doesn't have commercial value and then i need to go do do these other things so that I can make money, so I can live and support myself, and so I can do this thing that I care passionately about. Because we, we intuitively know, although we not, we're very often scared to say this out loud, that what we're doing as artists is valuable, that has value in the world, right? And if we can, if we are so passionate about our work and we let that passion shine through our work, value will people will be magnetically attracted to that because we're standing in that instead of saying, I need to do this other thing so that I can make my work. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's, we, we have to be able to, to not split that idea that you have to do one or the other, or that they can actually, those two ideas can be mutually supportive of each other. In fact, that's what I think people, people who, um, people largely, this goes back to, um, you know, the loss of our creative identities as human beings for most of us, we're so estranged from the creative process. Like there's a part of us that's deep inside that's hungry to understand that lost part of us. And we get a glimpse of that by doing things like going to see art, seeing movies, participating in the consumption of creative things. And we have this curiosity about how does that, why does that make me feel this way? How did that's moving in me? And that's something I'm not, I've lost touch with. And I think there's a hunger for people to, um, 
to reconnect with that. And I think that's the sort of magic place that artists and entrepreneurs can work, that artists can either step into their entrepreneurship more fully, or entrepreneurs can reach down and find that blocked creative voice within inside of them and create something that doesn't have to be just for the commercial or just for the purity of the art form, but is actually a hybrid of the two. And that opens people's eyes to both sides of that, like both the question of how it creates value and how it's something that I do want to pay, give my money for, and also something that makes me more whole spiritually and something that connects me with who I am as a human being. I think that's a really fertile ground. And I think that's something, um, it's an opportunity for both artists and entrepreneurs to step up into that space and, and create that. It's not something that's very few people have created that successfully. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a space that's just, just beckoning people to come into. Yeah. How, you know, the, this thought is popping into my head over and over. How much of the, the resistance to sort of claiming the value of your work, whether you're a, you know, a painter or a musician or an actor or whatever your art form is, it comes out of a, a you know a childhood where whatever whatever happened you you come out of that it, it, you, with a with certain maybe it's self image issues um, or just issues of believing that you're a victim somehow those kinds of things because you know it, it just kind of comes to me that I don't remember ever seeing any sort of like documentary of some great artist who just had a great childhood and, and was, you know, blessed all the way, you know, they all had something ugly in the past. And that that seems to actually fuel the, the creativity. But I wonder if that's not also fueling the resistance to, to sharing or, or claiming the value of it. Mm. Does that make sense? Or yeah, that's just talking out of my ass. No, <laughs> I, 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 the first time. <laughs> Well, one thing that comes to mind is this um, this uh, notion that we have about the struggling artists. Mm. I think this is one of the one of the cultural myths we have about like artists need to be struggling, which also means starving, mm. like financially. Um, but struggling and uh, suffering, um, and this is the the place that. Um, so your question is like, is that, is that struggle and that suffering making it difficult for us to step into that value, that value that's there? Is it, is the, yeah, whatever, whatever struggle you had in your past, not necessarily yeah. even in the moment, although that's just, you just brought it with you. But if, if you grew up and you had, let's say you just had a bad childhood, you had abusive things going on and, and whatever went on, person grows up and finds a way to create amazing sculptures right but they're they've got a hundred of them in a in a garage and they don't show them or you know they let them go for dirt cheap or something where they're just they're they're not ready to claim the value of what they're doing mm -hmm. and i'm just wondering how like how common is that is that it seems like it might be kind of oh a, yeah it's super common it's, but I don't, I don't know if that's, um, uh, people are maybe, afraid of judgment. I mean, that, that inability to step into the value of your work and claim it mm -hmm. and own the power that you feel in it is related to our inability to feel that with truth, just within ourselves. Right. Right? And yeah, you could go back and say that's connected to something from childhood, but it's definitely something you bring with you. Right. And it's, um, and, and it's something that, uh, I lost my train of thought. I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but something what you just said, and maybe this will help you, but what something you just said is, is that the two are connected. Yeah. Claiming your own value along with claiming the value of something that you create. Oh, absolutely. You're one and the same, essentially. Yeah, they're one. You know why you create something? That's that's you. Exactly. Yeah, and actually, that's that's something that I wanted to say was that um, when we, so one thing, one sort of insecurity or uh, yeah, insecurity that artists deal with is this 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 um, notion that we're sort of self-centered, 
um, or they were maybe a little mm. narcissistic and we just need attention, look at me, look at these things I made. Mm. Um, but the question that uh, we want to ask here is what, so if the things that you're making in the world, the things that you're creating are authentic reflections of yourself, there'll be a resonance there, right? The, the things you create outside will mirror how you're feeling and who you're being on the inside, right? And so in that sense, there's those things you create are, are you, right? They're just extensions of you into the world. Um, but as we talked about earlier, you're constantly creating. So if the image that you're projecting, <coughs> excuse me, the image or the images that you're projecting out in the world, those are things you're creating too. If those, th if those things don't feel like they're authentic representations of you, and don't feel like they're in resonance with who you are and who you're being. That's what narcissism, narcissism actually is, right? An over um, preoccupation with what that image is out there, thinking about that image out there that I'm putting out there, being concerned about what it looks like. What, that, what, is, what does my presence in the world look like? That's narcissism, mm -hmm. right? When your presence in the world is not a concern in terms of what it looks like, but is a concern in terms of what it feels like? Is it actually connected to who I am? That's truth, right? That's showing, that's opening up and that's showing yourself. Um, and that's hard to do, right? It's hard to take what's in here and put it out there. Um, but it's the only way to be authentically self-expressed. Otherwise you're um, creating some sort of fiction of yourself or wish that you were something else. Mm. Oh, I don't know where I want, where that, why I wanted to bring that up or what we were talking about before that. <laughs> That's all right. But you're, yeah, you know, it's a just very interesting ah. way, uh, Tim, that you put that question. Um, on one side, you see, uh, you know, be accepted that I guess, you know, as you go through contrasts and, and uh, adversity, right, um, that gives you data, right? Contrast is data, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it could then be processed by a creative, you know, uh, sort of like um, uh, being and manifest into some kind of expression, right? From the experience, from whatever. Um, so that contrast at the same time, together with giving you data, could also put some blocks. As I, that's what I understood that you were saying, right? And so on one side, you got something from it. On the other side, it's blocking you from actually expressing it because maybe there, you, you're not uh, accepting yourself. You're judging yourself, right? That you're not believing yeah, this is, yeah, this is, in your own authenticity this because is what we of all the deal with. programming installed, right? This is, that's, Already, yeah, that's life. Yeah. That's what we all deal with, yeah. except that with artists, they're more actively putting a piece of themselves out there somehow. Right. The rest of us are more just dealing with the kids and staying at home and go to work or whatever and, and just sort yeah. of anonymous. Yeah. Yeah. But so artists right. are, are putting it out there mm. and then they've got this built-in mechanism going, no, don't do that. That's making yourself vulnerable. That's, you know, all of that stuff. Open yourself to judgment, yeah. right? Rejection yeah. maybe. That's an, kind of like on the other side of this, right? Michael, you were saying about being sort of like concerned that you're not authentic or maybe perceived as somebody like, so you're concerned how you perceive, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another thing, right? Here is you're like, okay, I, I, I don't accept myself and I'm judging self, which is another thing. Judging self is another thing, that, another layer that you want to peel right. off to get to freedom, right? And yeah. so you're kind of like in the middle of this and if you break through, but how do you? I mean, there has to be some kind of enlightenment happening where you accept yourself. And I think that's what you mean. Like when you said struggling artist, to me, the word struggling was actually fighting these two demons, kind of like, okay, how do I achieve authenticity? Right? That I, and then I think from there, you could show the most stupidest thing with such confidence that everybody resonates with it because it's authentic. You know, you know it, I, we went to the Museum of Modern Art on a canvas. It could be a stain, and they're looking at it as like, yeah, wow. I got an example for it. We went to the Museum of Modern Art in LA, yeah, 
and they had a piece of plywood. Mm -hmm. The knot holes in the plywood were painted blue. Mm -hmm. And this is on display in the Los Angeles Museum of Modern Art as art. Art in the first place, great art on mm -hmm. top of that. I just, it's, you know, I, <laughs> I can't buy it on any level. It's, mm. the, it's, it's something that I, pro I did similar stuff when I was six, you know, that's not somebody creating something and putting it out there. That's somebody creating something and his, his self, uh, self assigned elite intellectual friends, decided oh this is great you know we're gonna i don't know it's but then i don't know what my point was either well, if they're authentic but, though you gotta love it i mean their their confidence and their alignment with self that uh, i mean this is reality it's beauty no matter how you put it right <laughs> okay i mean it's just do you do you have do you can you receive it or not right so you how much beauty do you need? How elaborate should it be for you to start receiving well, beauty? You know? it, it, there should be some amount of skill in it. Right? Okay. Some so amount of effort in it. Some amount of, you know, here's, here's something new. Here's, you know, there's some, well, so, uh, I don't know. So what I, what I would encourage you to do there, Tim, is to look at, the, is to become aware of what you're in resistance to. Right, so you just, you kind of just did that, right? You just mm. said that, well, art should have, you just listed off some criteria, right? It mm. should be new. Well, it doesn't have to have all of them, but well, there should be something in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that something is whatever it is so far is missing for you, right? It should be new mm. or um, it should have skill, right? Um, or I can't remember if you said a third thing there, but, um, and the thing that Gabi said too about, but what, what if it's authentic? What if it's authentically <laughs> his expression? Does it have to be complicated, right? Do we say to um, a child who's in full self-expression with their paints and crayons or whatever it is on the floor that that's not skillful enough, right? It, also, we, we could we could rethink what we mean by skill. Yeah. Like, do we mean craftsmanship? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, one thing, an example I like to talk about a lot is Duchamp's ur urinal, right? People. People who don't uh, know a whole lot about um, how that operated in the world uh, at the time sort of look at that and say, oh, well, he just put a, a urinal on, on a pedestal and called it art, <sighs> right? In the same way that people talk about Jackson Pollock and say, I could make that. I mean, you just sort of articulated that argument. I could make that. I could drip paint all over the canvas, mm. right? But the question to ask is what's, what's coming through those artists at that time? I mean, you're right to... Not that you're right. You're, you're wise to be. No, I like um, that. I'm right. That's I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another thing you could look at, right? You're right. But you're wise to be to be critical or to be um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, suspicious, mm -hmm. right? Or to, to or to recognize that there are certainly lots of artists out there who are who are fakes, right? Mm -hmm. Who are clearly not in alignment with anything great inside them. They're making something for. They're playing the game for either ego satisfaction or commercial success or prestige or whatever, right? It could right. be so many different reasons why they're doing it. Whereas there's others who are trying to create from a really aligned place. And the question we want to ask ourselves is how do we know? Mm -hmm. How do we know where they're coming from? And it's, it's so easy to quickly look at something that say I could do or my six year old could do and say, and, and use that as a reason for it's not good enough, right? But there might be something, you never know, right? You're right, that yeah. person who, who painted the blue spots on the knots and the plywood, they could be a hoax. Um, but they could also be looking at something that is more, uh, well, a deeper, right? And how do we know until we investigate, until we start to ask what, what questions or what decisions did this, did this person make when they're creating this? What decisions did the curator make when they decided to show this? What, decisions were the, the, the copywriters making? What kind of, the way that it brings up a certain dialogue within you, what is that? Is there value in that? Right? There's a lot of different ways in which art functions in the world. And you know, Duchamp's journal was, was genius at the time and has left the art world sort of in its reverberation since then because he lifted the veil on how we define art. 
I right? wish we could show the slide for this one. Oh, maybe, I've, yeah, I mean, just to, just maybe you could insert it later. It's going to be maybe, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. See, I'm unfamiliar with it. I don't like kind of got a picture from what you described earlier, but I know nothing about it. Yeah, I can't remember. This was like 1910-ish. I uh, can't remember the exact date, but basically there was a urinal in a gallery show on a pedestal as a sculpture. Mm. I mean, he signed it R. Mutt. So uh, it was not scandalous because it was a, well, it was slightly scandalous because it was a urinal, but the, the everlasting message there is that it's not about what you make, it's about the context. If it's in a museum, if it's in a gallery, it's art. That defines yeah. it as art, right? Yeah. And so we have to, that, 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 I mean, you sort of brought this up when you said it's in the Museum of Modern Art. So this, gives, this is an institution which gives it that value, right? The right. fact that it's un, between these walls is a, um, something that we give meaning to. Mm -hmm. yep. right? And then so it, that's an opportunity for us to look closer at, well, why do we give it that meaning? Why do we give it that value because it's between those walls versus not between the walls in my house? or in my neighbor's garage where they just made it, right? It allows us to be conscious of how we create value and how we create meaning. And this idea of how we create value is at the very center of this, right? How do artists and entrepreneurs and anybody create value for what they're doing, right? Part of it is a game. That's what Duchamp sort of uncovered. It's a game. Yeah. You really, is, you, and that's what so many people, whether you're an artist or you're in business, understand is like you learn how to play the game and you get rewarded. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. um, I was just in a recording by uh, Alan Watts, who wrote a lot about um, on Taoism, and the, the, the key is not to take the game so seriously, right? Mm -hmm. Play the game sincerely and play the game wholeheartedly, but always remember that it is a game, right? And that yeah. play it how you how you want to play it. Yeah, I spun off. Well, the dice. Yeah. I have a tendency yeah, no, to have a point sometimes when I'm speaking, but uh, but that's kind of like the which I keep bringing up a lot in our conversations on the show is, is it's, you know, what you're doing is not about the end game, right? And, and in sports, whether you win it or you lose it, there's value in how you play that game. Right? Mm -hmm. If you, you play somebody who's better than you, you're going to get better as a result, assuming you're actually trying. Right? Yeah. Um, so, Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's an interesting, uh, um, you know, a little, little uh, side of, of this, I guess, on the, on the side of this, how we, we kind of brushed up on that, you know, how do you perceive art, right? And so far, guys, I think we talked about how your mind interprets art, right? Game, what value, all these things, right? Um, we are from the Abraham Hicks, uh, uh, you know, powerful co-creators, and um, uh, and we are actually the believers that we need to get ourselves out of that mind interpretations, right, and start perceiving things on the most surest guidance system that was given to us. Mm -hmm. And what is that? Emotion. Emotion. So I'm looking, uh, I'm going to some, I, you know, I often go to, to um, in, interesting exhibitions and including uh, modern art. And I, I know what you mean, Tim, by I'm, I'm looking and I, I'm immediately, my mind comes in and says, I could have made that, you know, what a silly thing this object is and why would they even display it here, right? But okay. that's when mind, the mind comes in, right? Before the mind comes in, how about put a break on that and say, don't enter just yet. I want to experience it on an emotional level. What emotion does it invoke for me to see this object and forget its function, forget, uh, oh my God, they wanted me to have this shock, you know, whatever. That will be again, mind, 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 mind. What emotion does it invoke, right? And then if, they, if I'm not stimulated, and I'm like giving it a fair chance. Okay, do, do I feel any emotional response to this? How does it make you feel? Am I intrigued? Like in, in the way that, like does it remind me of my childhood, for example? Or does it make me... But, you're, but your emotions are based on thoughts. No, 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 I'm, I'm kind of assessing it. Okay, what am I feeling? My thoughts are in response to what emotion is this? You know, I'm trying to read it, basically, right? They're not... How, 
you don't They're feel an emotion. Their own, right? You don't They're, feel an emotion without your brain processing what you're looking at somehow. Right, but the the, the thought could be basically kind of on their own, on its own, right? Kind of like, you know, your mind control thought, right? Or it could be kind of sort of like a meditative thought. It's your being. Let's not give it a name of thought, right? It's when you start breathing and you're starting to feel, you know, kind of shut down all the intellectual powers, right? And start processing, okay, what am I feeling? Am I, what kind of emotional response? And this thought is also a thought, right? But this is me, me, my being is basically kind of, kind of poking, okay, what, what is that uh, response that this thing is evoking in me, right? And then even a, a urinal or whatever, and, or something that, that's completely just not making any sense because there's no pattern. Sometimes I'm looking at some modern art and there's just, you know, minds are great pattern recognitions. So there's no pattern and you're standing there and it's like, okay, the mind is not gonna achieve anything here. What does it make you feel, you know? And sometimes I'll tell you, I, ha I, I have no emotion. I, I don't know how, how to do it. It just, I, I have indifference, mm -hmm. you know? And then that's fine too. I gotta accept what I feel. That's a great response to it. This doesn't touch me. Maybe because this artist is not aligned. We are not on the same vibration. And maybe that artist was not really, um, you know, in my uh, kind of, I, I, we are not on the same disc. So I didn't perceive that artist's vibration. So I'm going to go look for an artist who vibration, whose vibration I am going to receive. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to find your favorite artists, right? On the emotional level, not on the intellectual level. Or maybe then after that on intellectual as well. Yeah. Once the mind comes comes in and interprets it, and it's like, oh my God! If if on top of this emotion there is a great, deep meaning and context, you know, uh, then you appreciate it even even more, right? Then mm -hmm. you got some message in there. And I love art that carries messages. You know, having grown in a, a society that was trying to build communism. That's all that we were receiving, you know, all the time. And I was truly inspired by it, you know, so. Michael, you need to just jump in if you feel the need. I'm telling you <laughs> I should maybe have warned you in the beginning. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we no. interrupt each other all the time. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah I, you incredible. know, one of the, the yeah. thoughts that comes to me is, is art is, is not a universal thing, right? It's very subjective. And it's you know, what, what might pass for art as great art through in the Western world, right, might be seen by another culture with complete confusion and have no, if they have no point of reference to it, you know, the, the random patterns on a chalkboard or something, we look, might look and go, wow, that's, you know, I don't know. I get nothing from that, but coming from somebody else's culture, that may be, their representation of, of some, uh, you know, something important. Yeah, I think art, I think we have to remember that art is a, um, it's a Western concept. It's not really that old in our humanity. Mm. And as a concept that privileges artists or that privileges certain select people, yeah, you're right that it doesn't, it's not, it's not, uh oh, sorry, I have to knock my power cord out and it's gonna disappear on me if I, okay. Um, if we uh, if we can go back before the concept of art existed, right? We're still creating human beings, yeah. right? We're still creating. We're still what function? What what was art before there was art? We were and what what art? What function does being artistic or being using artistry or using creative energy serve for human beings? Right. So we're sitting around. There's a bunch of materials around us. Okay, we're going to start exploring these materials. What do these materials do? I'm going to fold these things this way. I'm going to rip them or cut them or glue them or do whatever to them. And I'm going to explore these things. We're, we're, we're making things to make, to understand them, right? To understand our relationship to them, to understand our relationship to the world, the things outside of us and how we have power to, to manipulate that. Um, and so in this sense, art serves this very, uh, you know, the, the first, the oldest piece of, I mean, when you, 
don't even need to go in and calling it art, but it was like 500 million years ago, they found a, um, a zigzag pattern scrawled on a, uh, a muscle shell or some kind of shell, right? What caused that? It wasn't even a homo sapien, right? It was some other human ancestor. What caused them to do that? Right? Was it a visual representation of, say, a lightning bolt? Was it a simply just a, a question of like, here I am with this shark tooth in the shell and I just open the shell to eat the, the contents and now I'm just going to see what this does, right? What happens if I move this back and forth on here? Or does it, um, does it show like the terraces of a hill? Or is it, right? I mean, we don't really know, but we know that it's done for some reason. There's some like impulse in us to make things. Well, it could be Michael, just funny. <laughs> it could be how the, he escaped from, uh, from a lion. <laughs> it could be so many different things, right? Um, we, yeah, it's hard for us to know what's going on, but it serves some sort of function, right? It serves some sort of purpose. And we as human beings, art or creating things has at least evolved with us as human beings from the beginning, right? The creation of just things and tools and manipulating our world with our hands. Well, it was a form of, of storytelling for yeah. one thing, right? Yeah. Cave drawings and that kind of thing. Right. Um, but it's a way that we make meaning from our world, right? It's yeah. we need, we need to make things to create meaning in our world. And we can't, we're, we are meaning creators. We can't really avoid that. It's part of our nature. And it's, um, um, so this, this question of like whether or not something can be called art, I like to kind of steer it back to what does art do for us? Mm -hmm. What is it, this question of what does it allow us to feel? What does it allow us to be? What does it allow us to understand about ourselves in the world, our place in it, our relationship to it? Um, those are much more interesting questions than, that, than what we can or cannot call art. Yeah, well, that's an old argument too, yeah. yeah. So, but let's go in a different direction. What, because... Yeah. What is, I, I, there's two things. One is uh, I don't want to lose sight of the uh, hand drawing exercise. We're going to describe that for people. They can do it on their own. Cool. And I don't, Gabby, I'm, I think I described this to you. Um, but I, don't, I want to bring that up in a minute. But let's talk right now about, you know, if we're all agreeing that we are, each and every one of us, walking the planet, if we're all creative beings, and we have this, it's a drive. In fact, I, I, it, I was thinking about this a week or so ago and it kind of clicked for me. You know, you hear a lot over the years that, that the mind doesn't recognize when you say no. It doesn't recognize a, ne a negative. It's like, don't, you know, don't forget to pick up milk on your way home, right? you're going to forget to pick up milk because it doesn't know it's a creative engine that's going on and it's always creating and you give it an instruction. It doesn't, it can't create a negative. It can't create. No, it creates pick up milk, right? Or forget to pick up milk. So, so we're all creating all the time. So how, how can we sort of, and maybe the way to go with this is, is there an exercise maybe or something along this direction that you can, you can suggest for people to maybe to, to I, I think everybody would, would appreciate feeling more creative, right? No matter what it is, is there something that, that you would suggest for people who, who maybe feel like I don't have a creative bone in my body? Well, uh, try this do this for a couple of days or an hour or whatever it is. And, and you know, what, what can get people started down that path so that, you know, what we're trying it, cause it's, it's opening up that channel to something more, something bigger than us. Right. Yeah. So I think getting in touch with your, getting into your body is, is the, the key first thing. Um, because your body, you know, we, we talk a lot about mindset and what your mind can do, but your mind is not just up here. It's, 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 it's in your entire body. Your entire body is a system of, of perceiving and knowing. And, um, you know, the, I, I love that example you just, <coughs> excuse me, gave about the milk. Mm. So you can either um, want to get the milk because you want the milk, or you can worry about not getting it. Right? And either way, you're going to create either you either create 
a condition in a container for you to do that thing that you want, which is get the milk, or you create the container of, I'm going to forget the milk, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to feel bad about that. And so I'm worried about that. And I always forget the milk. Yeah. I hope I don't forget the milk this time. And of course that, you know, yeah. that's what that's creating is it's creating the conditions for you to forget to create it, to, right. to get it, right? Um, and so by aligning with what you want, and this does mean coming into your body and to listen to what your body wants, not just some sort of fantasy that you're created up here about what you want, but what is it that your body's telling you about what you want and what you want to make and what kind of life you want to create um, and listening to that. So the, the most important thing is, is doing something physical, right? And, you know, the drawing exercises, those are all physical exercises, even the ones that seem mm -hmm. to only use the hand and the eye. You know, you, that's translated. All drawing exercises in which you're drawing with your hand are translated through the body, right? It's not just a matter of motor skill or, um, you know, something that you just a learned thing like that. But it's um, allowing your body to open and be a channel for energy to move through. Because mm -hmm. that energy wants to move. Yeah. So in your milk example, there's some block there that prevents it from moving, right? That keeps it stuck. That says that, um, you know, whatever it is, whatever story you tell yourself about, like forgetting to pick it up. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't remember too many things going on in my head. I can't keep them straight or um, someone's going to be mad at me because I forgot it again or whatever it is. Or I'm being mad at myself and, and we're in resistance to that mm -hmm. energy. So the more that we can open up our bodies and, feel what's happening inside of us, feel all those emotions, right? I'm glad that Gabi wrote up about this, this, this idea of how important it is for us to feel our way into creative work, into artwork. That's, that's where we find truth. Um, so I know that's not a specific exercise, but it's, um, that's why it's so common for us to have these creative hits when we get up from our desk or get up from where we're working and we go, take a shower or we go on a walk or whatever. We do something where we change our bodily state and we allow the energy to start moving. That's step number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's fundamental. Without that step, there is no real creativity happening. There's, there's kind of miscreating and sort of nervous recreating of things we've already done before and this mm -hmm. sense of not being sure and not being second guessing ourselves. Um, so yeah, it, that's, are you, are you, kind of keeping your stelt, yourself stuck in the in the mind if you're if you're if you don't get up and like move away from the desk get up and go take a walk take a go jogging whatever you're not sure how i'm I, i'm not saying this the way i want to say it um maybe i should have kept just yeah no okay it'll either come back to me or it won't go ahead and yeah, well, I mean, I think another way of reframing that is just like if we're creating from, from our full sense of being in alignment with our, what we want, um, what we desire, with what's happening in our heads, like the thoughts that we're holding in our heads, the, the way that we're using our minds to imagine what we're trying to, what, what's, what we want to create, right? Mm -hmm. That has to be in alignment with what we're feeling in our body, what we want subconsciously, right? If we have something in our subconscious that says, I can't, do this, I'm not good enough. And then in our mind, we're trying to create, make something perfect. It's not going to work. Right? They're just, they're, there's no congruency there. And so we have to kind of go into this deep place where what is, what is moving in me? What is this energy that's wanting to move through me? Hi, this is Tim Starr. Thanks for joining me and Gabi on the, the universe between your ears. We really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us for a little while. And we'd like to see you again. So be sure to subscribe wherever it is you're consuming the podcast from, whether it's YouTube or Stitcher or iTunes or whatever the hell else is out there. We want to see you again. We also want to hear from you. So let us know what you think of each episode. Let us know if you've got an idea for a future episode that you think would be just killer. Absolutely. Let us know. All right. Thanks again. And we will see you next time around.